That's why there's a massive hole there. Oh, what? That's sewage water. Oh, yeah, I got those. Made from like leaky pipes. Yes, ma'am. Does anyone have an answer? We, 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 we voted. We voted democratically and Monday won. Well, no, we voted democratically in Monday one. And occasionally, I am all right with this being a democracy. Usually, it's a dictator. No. No, there's no turning in the form on Tuesday. That's Wednesday you can do that. On Wednesday, when the actual final is scheduled, yes, you come. Tuesday, the morning is a regular day. I can't say that for real loud. Yes, ma'am. Gee, thanks, ma'am. Yes. I can't say no. Okay, guys, let's go over. Let's go over the, the final schedule again, just so we're crystal clear. Monday is a regular, normal day. You will take your final in here. You are supposed to. The expectation. Let's do it this way. The expectation is that you come to all seven of your classes that day. Okay. Tuesday is a semi-regular day, right? Everything will be regular through fourth period. Starting fifth period, fifth period will be like 20 some odd minutes. Sixth period will be 20 some odd minutes. Seventh period will be your hour and a half final exam. If you are exempt from that seventh period exam, right? When the exam starts, you leave, okay? I, I would go ahead and have one of those little sheets ready to turn in. Shoot, sorry, I've been putting out metaphorical fires here for like the last 24 hours, so I still did not print those sheets out. I promise y'all I will get them, okay? Um, I would have a sheet for Tuesday just in case. On Monday, if you are exempt from your first period final, you will arrive to school at 9.45. You will go to your first period, you will sit down quietly so as to not interrupt or disrupt the students that are taking their final exam. You will stay there for about 10 minutes, then you will come transition to this class. You will sit in this class for five or 10 minutes or whatever until Mr. Forshee gets on the intercom and says, if you are exempt from your second period exam, turn in your paper and exit the building. You will all give me a paper, all of you. I mean, unless you really don't have a way home and then you and I can just stare at each other for an hour and a half. <laughs> and I can give you my like super creepy smile. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if, if you if you have a way off campus, turn the paper in and and vamos. Okay? Do not come back for the rest of Tuesday. Okay? Third period, fourth period, fifth period, sixth period on Tuesday. Wednesday, sorry, this is Wednesday. Do not absolutely nobody cares. Can you leave with have you been in But you already took the test. Yes, everybody is leaving. Every so here's the thing. Let's say for the sake of argument on Thursday, you have to take your sixth period exam because y'all can't exempt everything because you're juniors. And so you just decided, I'm going to take my sixth period final exam. Okay, You're going to take your sixth period final exam, have the piece of paper. The minute you are done with the test, if it takes you 20 minutes to do the test, turn the test in, turn the paper in, and leave. Nobody is going to stop. Who else had their hand? Yes, ma'am. I don't know who that is. Is that the dual? Is that the dual English teacher? I. Okay, wait, 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 wait. You're taking your English final exam this week. Yeah. Yeah. Lone Star's requirement. Lone Star's requirement. Yeah, it's dual. Lone Star's requirement. Lone Star's requirement is that the exam be given between the eighth and the fifteenth. Yeah, it's written oh. out there. Sorry, 12th to the 15th. Oh, I'm taking my final today. Yes. Yeah. For a dual class. For dual, English. Uh, sure. Class, oh, sure. Uh, well, uh, he is in violation of Lone Star policy. Okay. I, if I were you, I'd keep him out shut. 
Okay, but that that is that is a large part of the reason why I'm giving you your exam on Monday at the first available opportunity per Lone Star's policy. Right. I have better things to do with my life than rat out other people who don't follow policies. I, listen, if y'all have not figured this out yet, I'm a social Darwinist, okay? Like, like I, I believe everybody should just do what they want to do in life, so long as it's not actually harming other people. And like, if you're an idiot and you can't survive, that's a you problem. So, so long as you're not actively harming another human being, I will never, ever, 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 ever dic try to dictate, try to dictate somebody else's behaviors. Ever, ever. It's just me. All right. Any other repetitive continued questions about exemptions and when to stop coming to school? No? Let's get on to reconstruction then, all right? So we, we, we've gotten to the end of the war, right? We know that the war ended. We know uh, that, that a whole bunch of, of things have happened, right? Um, so the, 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 the war is a Union victory, right? The South is forced to surrender the very Southern armies. Um, and we should know that the South is just absolutely devastated. Okay, again, um, as warfare has advanced, right? Do you understand what I mean when I say that? Technology. So, yeah, part of it is technology. Part of it is, is like, the, 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 the more we advance as a society, like, the larger we get, right? Like, like, you understand there are way more humans alive today than there were 100 years ago, yes? The more humans there are, the more humans there are to kill in war. Right? So as we progress, things sort of get worse in terms of uh, uh, combat, combat related deaths, casualties, destruction, all of that stuff. Okay? Um, the other thing is, and I think I, 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 every time I teach um, hi history to students, um, Americans, but this is not trying to knock Americans, right? Um, but Americans for generations now have lacked sort of an understanding, a conceptual understanding of what war really does, right? Um, it's, it's actually part of the reason, you'll, you'll learn this next year in government, why the United States will never win another war. Because we are unbelievably naive as, what it is, as to, to what war is, okay? Um, and a large part of the reason why we are unbelievably naive as to what war is, is because this is the last, this is the last you know, war that the United States will fight on American soil. Do you understand that? Right? Like 9-11 and Pearl Harbor are two instances in which people attacked us and destroyed our stuff. But then that's it. All the rest of our fighting occurs in other people's country and we destroy other people's stuff. Right? And the destruction, the, 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 uh, what's the word I'm looking Tan Tangential, it's not the correct word. Collateral destruction that occurs, right? That's the correct word. The collateral destruction, right? So if Caleb and I are in a war, right? And let's just say for the sake of argument, like his house and my house are countries, right? And we're at war with one another. And I go to bomb his house and I miss slightly, right? And I hit Aaron, his next door neighbor. That's collateral damage, yes? There's in it. And so when you're talking about large, like actual countries, right? Um, now what happens is that you have schools and factories and homes and all sorts of things that theoretically are not part of the scope of combat that are being destroyed. Okay? And so we see this on a large scale in the Civil War because, again, everything that we're dealing with is American in nature. right? Therefore, every life, life lost is an American life. Every uh, factory destroyed is an American factory. Every everything, right, is American, and therefore all of the destruction, all of the 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 loss, both of life and of of, of sort of wealth, 
right, is American in nature. Um, and specifically now, it's, it's the South, because it's the Union Army that really invades the South, right? And so the South specifically is devastating, right? You see that, that basically 20% of all Southern white males are dead. That is an incredibly significant portion of the population. Okay, 20% of a, just, just to put this into perspective, right? Um, the Spanish flu, which is the flu of 1918, is probably the worst, worst pandemic of modern times, right? Anybody know what percentage of the population it kills? Three, 3%, right? Like you lived through COVID. COVID killed what percentage of the population? Like 0 0.01. Did COVID didn't kill anybody? Not when you talk about like the actual global like population. It didn't kill that many people. So here's the thing. If you go back and you actually look at the data for COVID, COVID was killing like 5% of elderly people. Right? Like it was killing a relatively high percentage of people over the age of 70 or people with what are called comor comorbidities, right? Meaning that you were grossly obese or you had diabetes or you already had like kidney failure or, or heart problems. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it was killing people like that, right? But that's still a relatively small percentage of the population, right? I mean, you're talking about death tolls that, that for COVID is under 1%. Right, the Spanish flu is 3%. Here we've killed 20% of white men. This is a ridiculously high percentage. Okay, um, that is going to be very, very problematic and it'll actually lead to some other issues. Okay, um, we also have all sorts of infrastructure destruction, right? Infrastructure is just roads, town, uh, uh, town halls, churches, um, any anything that, that people are using um, sort of communally, right? Like that's infrastructure. A school would be infrastructure. As Sherman marches to, to Atlanta and then back north through South Carolina into North Carolina, like we're just destroying everything, right? It was that concept of total war. Well, once the war ends, now all of that like debris, rubble, ruin has to be dealt with. Okay. Somebody is going to have to come in and rebuild everything in the South. Somebody's going to have to come in and, and clear all of the, the sort of burnt remnants of, of Sherman's March, right? And try to retill soil and plant crops and regrow things, right? Um, and for certain things, like if you had an orchard, right, with like trees and your trees are all burnt, you realize like you out of business for a decade, yeah? Right, because your peach tree in South Carolina is not just going to like grow overnight and start producing peaches in six months. Right, agriculture, which is what the South has, is an incredibly labor-intensive, slow process that requires a crap ton of planting. Right, because you are literally talking about planting and tilling and growing for things that you are going to sell six months down the road, with the hope, the hope that in six months, the prices are gonna be good enough that you're actually going to be able to like, make ends meet, survive, right? I mean, I hate, like, if you wanna be a farmer, God bless you, I, that's, I would hate that job. I mean, I, I would love it, but like, only if I was so wealthy, I didn't have to worry about surviving on it. Okay. All right, uh, significant wealth discrepancy. Right, um, emancipation actually causes a, a part of that. I think we talked once before about the idea of um, reparations, right? Slave reparations and whether or not we should be providing money to black people. There was actually an expectation or a, a plan um, that doesn't happen, right? During uh, reconstruction that we were going to give all former slaves 40 acres and a mule, right? In order for them to go and be able to start their own farm and have their own property and whatnot. That doesn't happen. Um, on some level, constitutionally, there probably should have been reparations to the actual slave owners. They had their property 
thinking, right? And I you know, obviously have to put property there in quotes because we're talking about human beings, okay? Um, but you cannot just take away the source of wealth for these people and expect everything to be okay, right? Your, your elites within the South lose a significant amount of their wealth because they no longer have slaves, right? Um, and then again, because you, you so much of the fighting has occurred in the South and is agrarian, right? There goes your economy. There goes your entire economy for everybody because you don't do anything else but grow raw materials. So as the war ends, we have to figure out how to reconcile everything that's happened. Okay? And so this is going to get wildly complex because initially Abraham Lincoln, who is a, a, a very heavy handed president, right? Um, he is probably, if not exerted the most control over government in American life as an executive, he is, he is a very, very close second to Andrew Jackson, right? He is probably first in terms of expanding the powers of the presidency, okay? Um, the reality is, is there's there are some people that will argue that there, there are things that were done by Abraham Lincoln that are constitutional violations and should have resulted in him, in him being impeached. Okay? Now, he does those things because he believes that it's for the greater good. And so you'll learn next year in government, there's like clauses, there's like an elastic clause for what is necessary and proper. Right? And then you can kind of do whatever you want. Like, it's necessary and proper. It was necessary and proper to end slavery. Yes, it was. Therefore, the president can just whatever, right? Um, so understand that there's, it's not, it's not so easy as to say, like, this is exactly what should have happened or shouldn't have happened or whatever. Okay? Um, but he's going to expand the power of the presidency during his uh, tenure, his term in office. Um, and he intends to take the lead on Reconstruction, right? So Lincoln has this 10% plan, and, and basically it's the idea um, that if 10% of a state's voting age population, right, so VAP, if 10% of the voting age population takes an oath of loyalty to the Constitution, not to Lincoln, not to the Union, Right, not to Washington, D.C., but to the Constitution. If they will take an oath of allegiance to the Constitution, 10%, Lincoln's gonna welcome the state back into the Union and sort of all will be forgiven. Relatively simply, okay? I've told, I think I've told you over and over and over again, Lincoln is a Union first guy. Everything that he does is meant to preserve the Union. And so his belief is, is once the war is over, in order to continue to preserve the Union, he has got to bring the Southern states back in and make them feel as if they are a part of the United States again, and they are actively participating in this grand sort of social experiment that is American democracy. All right? So the reality is, is he's going to end up, as part of his plan, a whole bunch of people are going to get pardons. I think I told you um, last week when we did the actual Civil War, right? Jefferson Davis is the only dude actually imprisoned for treason as a result of the Civil War. And he's not even executed. He's just in prison. Right? And execution should be, should be the crime for treason. Right? So we're, we're not going to come down heavy handedly, right? And you'll see, you'll see some of the difference, okay? Because again, this is a very forgiving plan, right? After World War I, right? We'll talk about this in the spring. After World War I, World War II is a direct result. Understand this, a direct result of the terrible peace agreement from the end of World War I. Germany essentially has no option after the end of World War I other than to start World War II. That's it. Foregone conclusion. Because the peace agreement is not a good peace agreement. It is not an agreement that would actually establish or generate peace. Lincoln believes that what he's going to do would work. 
Okay? And a lot of moderates are willing to support Lincoln on this. Okay? There are a lot of people that think Lincoln is going to be able to pull this off and do it in a manner that would actually benefit everybody. There are people in Congress called the Radical Republicans who do not want Lincoln's plan. They are the more heavy-handed in this scenario. They are the ones that want a more militant reconstruction. They want to go in and force the South to change, right? To change the very culture and way of life <coughs> in the South. Okay? So they're trying to essentially redraw, recreate Southern culture and Southern society to eliminate the elitist plantation sort of ideology or mentality that had existed in Southern culture. Okay? And instead, they want yeoman farmers. They want people that they think would actually be more sympathetic to a Republican ideology or a Republican way of thinking in which everybody has their little piece of the pie and we just all move on in life and leave people alone. Right? They want black people to have full citizenship. They want to end racism. Um, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a huge burden right there. I don't know that you can ever end racism, period. Right? And you especially can't do it like that. You certainly can't do it in, in, a, in a year or five years. Right? It probably takes generations to really try to truly end racism. Okay? Uh, the, the Congress and the Union, right? and I still call them the Union because a lot of the Southerners are not back into Congress yet. Right? Um, we still have a relatively fractured political system. Okay? Um, but Congress is going to do a couple of things. One, they're going to pass the 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery in 65. That's going to end up going around and getting ratified. Um, but they also create the Freedmen's Bureau. Okay? And the Freedmen's Bureau is basically a governmental organization right, aimed at helping former slaves as they transition into their new lives. Okay? Our slaves lack wide variety of sort of skills, resources, right? Um, when we go back and we look at that antebellum culture, when we look at that slave society, understand that like slaves were not permitted to learn. They were not permitted to go to school. They were not allowed to learn to read and write, right? Um, religion was at the, the, the mandate or the dictate of the master of the plantation. If they wanted them to be religious, then they could be religious. If not, uh, religious ceremonies were denied to them. They did not have um, sort of any any opportunities uh, anywhere, right? They're going, the Freedmen's Bureau is, is aimed at trying to create um, opportunity, right? That's really what it is, is. It's a means of trying to generate opportunity for these former slaves. So they're going to do it in a variety of ways. One, they're gonna to try to provide some legal protections for former slaves. That means that they're gonna to try to ensure that slave, uh, 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 former slaves can enter into contractual agreements with whites that would actually be honored, right? Um, because again, we exist in a time where, like you understand that black people were not allowed to legally testify against white people in the South. Right, like if I went and murdered somebody in front of a black, like a black person was the only witness, right? I don't even have to kill the black person because they can't testify against me, right? Like literally they could go to the cops and be like, I witnessed the whole thing. And the cops would be like, well, whatever. I mean, you're, you're a worthless witness because I can't, I can't, I, you, you have no legal standing. I can't put you on trial, okay? So the Freedmen's Bureau is looking to do that looking to create legal protections, right? Looking to create um, sort of charitable contributions, right? Ways to uh, provide uh, newly freed slaves with clothing, with shelter, with food, right? Again, things that, that, that unfortunately, um, they, 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 they never had to worry about this before. Slaves never had to worry about going and buying clothes they were just given to them. They never had to worry about going and finding or procuring food. It was just given to them, 
right? And then this is obviously not to say that like, oh, slavery was great. Like the slaves didn't have to worry about anything. No, no, like obviously slavery sucks, right? But they also lack basic sort of behaviors that, that a lot of us take for granted because we've just engaged in them forever, right? Like you know that you have to be able to go to the store and find food and and I mean, at this point, like you're growing crops and you're canning some of it and you're, um, you know, boiling some of it, you're salting meat to save for a later date and, and all of that stuff, right? Like you are engaged in behaviors that you know are necessary in order to continue to be able to eat months down the road, right? But black people didn't, I mean, the former slaves, you know, let's say the former slaves, they didn't, they, these were not concerns that they had. They were not skills, soft skills that they had learned how to do. So the Freedmen's Bureau is, is trying to aid in that, right? And then finally, the Freedmen's Bureau is going to try to create schools. And this is going to become um, a really important thing moving forward, right? Uh, because education, one, education is paramount. Obviously, I would not be a professor, I wouldn't be a teacher, wouldn't be an educator if I didn't think that educating people was one of the most significant things that happens in a society, period. Right? I'm willing to work a job for which I'm grossly overworked and grossly underpaid because I think that it is that valuable, right? Um, the Freedmen's Bureau is going to look to create schools, right? Because again, there were no educational opportunities. And you, you, you have, I mean, at this time, you know, obviously like young black children, right? Um, because sometimes they were put to work on a plantation as young as like six, seven, eight years old. Okay? And, um, and that wouldn't have been uncommon for them to be put to work at that young of an age. Now, they were not usually out there with like, like the little reaper thing, was it called scythe? Is this what it's called? Yeah. Right, like out there like hacking down stalks of corn and wheat and stuff. Like they weren't doing that at age, right? Um, but they could have been put in the house, they could have been put um, in a wide variety of other positions where they were engaged in labor, right? Like they didn't have an opportunity to go to school, learn how to read and write, things like that. The Freedmen's Bureau has this idea that if we want to increase sort of the opportunity for former slaves, right? If we want to increase black opportunity and make them uh, somewhat equitable to, to whites and to everybody else in society, they need to be at e equally sort of knowledgeable, right? Like they need to have the same access to information and knowledge and education. So we're gonna create schools for them. <coughs> now, this probably, probably would have been all well and good until Lincoln's assassinated. Lincoln probably could have kept those radical Republicans at bay. Okay? Lincoln probably could have executed his plan um, and things prob probably would have been better off. And I say probably because obviously we're speculating wildly, right? And you'll learn in a minute, the dude that takes over is just terrible, right? Like might be the second worst president in American history. Okay, might, I don't know. I'd have to think hard, long and hard about that, okay? But so Lincoln gets assassinated. He's assassinated in a, in a theater, in Ford's theater, by a an actor, right? Who basically sneaks up into his booth, shoots him in the back of the head, right? Then jumps down, breaks his leg, um, like hobbles to his horse, gets on his horse, rides away, gets caught relatively quickly, and then is executed, right? And most of his co-conspirators are executed as well, right? Um, Lincoln is not the only one that they attempted to assassinate. God, don't I wish they'd gotten Johnson. Okay, here, I know, I mean, I, I stand by this statement. Johnson is terrible. He's absolutely terrible. He's a terrible, terrible person. I, I will say this. This would have gotten dicey, though, if Johnson and Lincoln had both been assassinated. Um, I, don't, I don't know who would have been president of the United States. We do, but that doesn't happen. That line of secession does not come about until the 1960s. So who's next? Secretary of State? There was nobody next. Oh. In fact, fun fun fact, prior to this point, right, um, because there's, there's, there's not a clear line of succession. I mean, basically Johnson just sort of, 
I, I am president now. You will address me as Mr. President. I am the president, right? Um, but there was nothing constitutional that stipulated that. There's nothing in the Constitution uh, original, like the original Constitution that was in effect in 18, uh, 1865. There was nothing that said that in the event that the president is killed, the vice president becomes the president. Doesn't say that, right? We don't have that until the 25th Amendment. Uh, and then the 25th Amendment is actually what says, like, President, Vice President, Speaker of the House, President Pro Tem, Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of this, yada, 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 all down the line, right? Until you get to the Secretary of Homeland Defense, who is the most recently created secretary position, and he's like 20, yeah, 20-ish, 20-ish, I don't know. He's wherever he is on the line. He's at the bottom of it, okay? Lovely. All right. Um, so we we attempted attempted to assassinate Johnson. It didn't work. Okay. Andrew Johnson is a Southerner. He is from Tennessee. He was a honestly, I don't think Lincoln really wanted him to be be vice president. It was more like a hey, let's throw the South a bone. And we'll name this Southerner because he's an actual Democrat. He's he's like right. He's he's a he's a Southerner. Let's name him vice presidential candidate, and then we can try to be like, look, South. Here's an olive branch. We put this dude as the vice president for you. Like, chill, relax, come back, and let's 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 make peace. And um, but then Johnson is going to take over, and Johnson is terrible he's terrible Johnson a part of Johnson's um, initial plan for reconstruction is Johnson wants every southern officer to come knock at the White House door and personally ask for a pardon per personally Right? So if you were a second lieutenant in like the Texas Cavalry out here in Houston, right? A second lieutenant, by the way, we know a second lieutenant is like worthless. You don't know, y'all probably don't understand military very well, right? Second lieutenants are utterly worthless. What? They, they pretend to order people around because they're an officer, but the reality is, is like a staff sergeant sh should be telling a butter bar what to do. Yeah, second lieutenants have the little gold bar. That's their rank. We call that a butter bar in the, in the Marine Corps. It's it's not a compliment. No, they're it, I, I look no disrespect to second lieutenants, but they're like that is the lowest level of officer you can be. Like those are the guys straight out of OCS. They're idiots. They have no understanding of how like the actual military really works. But they get to be in charge, and so they just run around like barking orders. And then what are called NCOs, which are non-commissioned officers, those are like senior enlisted people, are just like, yes, sir, and then they can do whatever they want anyways. And they tell the troops, dude, we're not like, like utterly so like 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 literally, this dude has no real authority. But if that was your position in the Texas Cavalry, now all of a sudden, according to Andrew Johnson, you've got to get on your horse and ride from Houston to DC to be like so, Mr. President, sir, can I please have a pardon, sir? Mr. President, thank you, sir. Like, utterly pointless. Okay? And not practical. Like, not, I mean, just not practical in the slightest. Oh, it's a terrible waste of time. Right? And it really just stems from the fact that Andrew Johnson is a terrible human being. He is a bitter, angry, terrible little person who is not a part of the Southern elites, and therefore he sees every officer as like an elite planter of the South, and those were the people that have oppressed him, and so he just uniformly hates all of them, and so he wants them to grovel, really to just make himself feel better. It's a very petty behavior. Yes, ma'am. So the, the pardon, what is that for? A pardon is basically governmental forgiveness. Yes, for any behavior, for treason in this regard. But you can actually pardon people for anything, 
right? Gerald Ford, in the 1970s, Gerald Ford pardons Richard Nixon for illegally recording people's conversations. What? That was his crime, right? That presidents issue pardons for all sorts of things. They have that, they have that authority. Any federal crime, a president could issue a, a pardon for it. It's part of the constitutional authorities that the president has, okay? What? Uh, Donald Trump pardoned somebody that Kim Kardashian wanted to pardon. Yeah, like her grandmother, basically someone died. I don't think it was her grandmother. Was that really wow. But like, well, I mean, not related to that. You all understand Kim Kardashian now has like a law degree, right? She's an actual lawyer. Really? Yeah. Like she's graduated from law school. I don't know if she passed the bar or not. I don't know if she took the bar. Um, I don't think she's ever really going to practice law. Um, but she has, what? Well, but not just that, it, it actually helps provide her with a whole bunch of knowledge to do other things that she's wanting to do because she, she does actively work toward like criminal justice reform, right? Like she and Kanye, when they were married, would like, like they were regular visitors to Trump's White House trying to, to fix, fix the, the, the American judicial system. What did you say? <laughs> I said it's because they're part of the I, okay, not, not, not related to, the, listen to me. I'm gonna be honest with you, if the Illuminati is real, and, and this is gonna if, sound absolutely terrible. If, if, if the Illuminati is real, a lot of people are not gonna be in it. You really think so? Yes, because that organization would be so old, it would still be racist. So They're not gonna let fly. They not. I feel like, and Jay Z? No, they're not in. I think mm -hmm. I wrote a whole essay on this. No. Nope. No, nope, I'm going to tell you right now. If, 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 if they let black people in, it's Obama and, and it's, it's Barack and Michelle. Those would be the first two. They not let nobody else in. Nah, just because, just because you are a, a I'm, I'm going to use, I'm going to use this term because it comes from like a very old concept called bread and circuses, right? If you ever, like, this is not related to today. If you ever find yourself as a dictator of a country, right, and you want to control people, it's actually really easy. All you have to do, and you can just run over them all you want. Like, you could murder people in the streets. Like, Donald Trump joked about this, right? Like, I could murder somebody and nobody would care. And he's actually not wrong, right? All you have to do, oh, whatever, that's still the other recording, I don't care. All you have to do is bread and circuses. Keep the people fed and entertained, and they're not gonna revolt. They're not gonna revolt, right? They're not. And so those entertainers, the circuses, you're not gonna put those people in the Illuminati, right? They're just working for you to distract everybody else from what you're doing over here, and which is just making yourself richer. No, the Illuminati's not gonna want them to be a part of it because the Illuminati doesn't, because here's the thing, the minute they no longer are performing, the minute they are no longer distracting the masses, they're gone and we'll get the next the, the next up and coming thing. That's that's part of the reason why people have 15 minutes of fame, right? Because if the Illuminati, which you're calling the Illuminati is real, they're using that 15 minutes of fame to distract you and then they're kicking that person to the curb and they're propping up the next person for their 15 minutes of fame in order to distract the masses. But they're not just because you get 15 minutes of fame, you're not getting any Illuminati. Mm -hmm. Nope, not happening, nope. Fair enough. <laughs> All right, so about the Illuminati. I don't think it's there. I know I don't believe it. She's very investigative. Well, okay. I she's listen. Was was the Illuminati real at one point? That's yes. almost absolutely certain. But, okay, can you give a background on what the Illuminati is? The, the Illuminati would simply be a secret society. There are all sorts of secret societies. Some, I... I don't know. Maybe, maybe probably not in this class. I've, I've, had, I've had students before um, that, that I, I... Because I actually knew somebody at UNC, at UNC that was part of like a secret society yeah like like actually like major college campuses is one of the massive recruiting places 
for like secret societies. No, you don't. I mean, maybe. It depends on the secret society. Yeah, like. But like, like there, there's, there's like a movie that's like 20 years old now called like the, I think it's called the Skulls, right? Which is, which is maybe a decent representation of what like secret society. Is. But they're, they're, they're basically the idea of the people behind the people that are actually running things. So if you listen, not related to U.S. history, but probably a valid conversation for government for next year. Like y'all, y'all understand that Donald Trump ran around for like years talking about I'm going to drain the swamp, I'm going to drain the swamp. The swamp would be the Illuminati. Right? When he says the swamp, what he's talking about are the people behind the scenes that are actually running things. Like, it's adorable if you think that your elected officials are actually the ones that are making decisions to run your lives. They're not. Right? Like, and I hate to say this because I'm going to tell you, like, next year, like, I go to every government and economics class twice, twice a year and, like, try to register kids to vote. I think voting is one of the most important things that you're ever going to do in American society. Yeah, right, like vote, you, you're gonna go vote for Troy Nels, right, or you're gonna vote against Troy Nels. That actually doesn't matter because Troy Nels is gonna win because we live in Texas and this is a Republican district, right? And then Troy Nels is gonna go to Congress and pretend that he's doing things, and ultimately he's not. He's not doing anything. Like he's not actually getting anything accomplished. Okay. Instead, it's a whole bunch of non-elected bureaucrats who are like the real elitists of America that are they're the ones doing everything, right? This, this, this is part of the reason why we have like a political ruling class, okay? Because they're, they're the ones that are controlling, they have vested interests in continuing to control, and the, they just create an illusion of choice and democracy, right? I mean, one of my favorite activities in government class is I show, I show my students a whole bunch of things, and I didn't do it, I haven't done it the last couple of years because it's a little outdated now, but it's like it's like a statement like which which president um, and it compared Bush and Obama right because that's a Republican to a Democrat and it was like which president did this right and the kids have to guess if it was Bush or Obama and they're like which president did this which president used taxpayer funds to bail out private industries for instance right like which president of the United States took my hard earned money right and gave it to a private company a private company who ran their own company into the ground. I, like, I'm mad about this. This is, this is 15 years later. I'm still angry about this, right? And do you know what the answer is? Do you know it was Bush or Obama? Cool. It was both. They both did it. One bailed out the banks, one bailed out the auto industry. The, the little activity that I do with my government kids is a trick activity. Everything up there, every statement up there applies to both Bush and Obama, which is wildly comical because here's the thing, right? If you go and ask people in politics today, like, was Bush a good president? Was Obama a good president? Right? Democrats are like, oh my God, Obama's like the greatest president ever! Right? Like, they, they believe that. And then they will tell you that Bush was just god awful. One of the worst presidents in American history. They're the same guy. They did the same things. If one of them is terrible, they're both terrible. If one of them is great, they're both great. Okay? But instead, it is a means to just further divide America. All right, let's actually get back to Andrew Johnson, the second worst, let's just go with second worst president in American history. Who's the first? Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> Woodrow Wilson is the worst president in American history. Hard stop, end of discussion. I will put that on a test question. Like that will be a final on the a question on the final in the spring. I know it's an opinion based question, but if you do not put Woodrow Wilson, I will mark it wrong. That's an easy two points. And I don't care what, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're like conservative or liberal, Republican or Democrat, like authoritarian or libertarian. He sucks at all of them, which takes a, like a, a level of skill that is on some level actually impressive because he's terrible at all of it. 
All right. So let's. All right. Let's finish with Johnson then. Okay. Um, so again, Johnson is is a, he's he's terrible. He is a petty little man. Um, he he wants all of these Southerners to come and ask for the pardon. Um, he wants a much more punitive. Uh, 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 reconstruction, right? He wants he wants the South to be punished more for uh, for their behaviors, right? For the for the course of the war, um, and specifically those elitists. Now, eventually, he's going to change his tune. Um, one, because I, I would hope I would hope people got to him and they were like, that's not like that's not feasible. It's just not possible to get all these people to come to DC and ask you for a pardon, right? Um, and so then eventually he's gonna sort of like, well, we'll just give everybody a pardon because he's also trying to garner some support amongst southern states because he doesn't have any support amongst northern states. Um, he is a wildly, wildly disliked president. Now, one of the good things that he does is he does require um, the he does require the, the the southern states that were in rebellion to ratify the Thirteenth Amendment before they can rejoin the union, right? Um, and that's the amendment that ends slavery, obviously. So, Freedmen's Conventions and Radical Republicans. Uh, so, the Freedmen's Conventions are basically. Um, black people getting together in order to try to exercise some some level of political uh, autonomy, right? They want to um, create some level of political uh, equality uh, between the races. They want to be able to have legal protections. Uh, they want to be a part of a concept that you'll learn about next year called rule of law, right? Which is really just the idea that we treat everybody the same under the law. Right? They want uh, the right to vote. They want uh, access to land, citizenship, contractual agreements, all of that stuff. Radical Republicans, they're really read, led by Thaddeus Stevens. That's the guy that you probably ought to know. Um, and they are the ones that are ultimately going to um, implement Reconstruction, right? And so they're gonna create um, sort of military Reconstruction. Uh, Radical Republicans tried to prevent Southerners from entering, re-entering into the Congress, right? Because uh, if you were a Southern Senator from South Carolina and you seceded, you left, and then once you're like, oh, the war's over, we lost, like those people try to go right back to being a part of Congress again, which doesn't make a lot of sense, all right? We'll finish this tomorrow, thank you. Since we got wildly off topic.